I've always wanted to be a scientist. Like, wouldn't it be a kick to work in a real laboratory and conduct neat experiments that show how things really work? Oh, here's one that's kind of fun. There we go. And now I'd like you to watch what happens when I blow between these ping pong balls. <laughs> it's neat. It's not hard to understand why the balls were attracted to one another. Air flowing over the curved surfaces of the balls reduced the pressure between them, and they reacted by moving together. That's the same way that airflow over a wing reduces pressure and creates lift. In case you don't see how all of this relates to the lift of a wing, let me show you one of my favorite demonstrations. And I'll use this nice radioactive, <laughs> crispy $20 bill. It'll be perfect. This will be just great. I'll reshape it a little bit, just like so. It has a nice, smooth curve to it, just like the camber on the upper surface of a wing. OK, we're ready. Now, everybody knows what will happen when I blow underneath the bill. No surprise. This is what happens, more or less, when someone tells you to <laughs> go fly a kite. Air pushing from below forces the kite to rise. And this is why you can make a barn door fly as long as you have enough power to drag it through the air fast enough. But this isn't the kind of lift we read about in training manuals. You know, all that stuff about Bernoulli and Venturi tubes and low pressure areas above the wing. Well, we can prove all of that theory just by blowing across the top of this $20 bill. Now watch. Isn't that fascinating? It's a great way to show your friends how a wing works. Now, I'd like to show you what really happens when... Nah, this is boring stuff. You've seen it all before. I've got a better idea. We're at the Northrop Rice Aviation Institute of Technology near Los Angeles International Airport. Northrop Rice has this wonderful smoke tunnel that will give us a chance to actually see how a wing works. Let's take a look. This is a conventional airfoil with an aileron. Notice the behavior of the airflow, or the streamlines, as the aileron is first raised and then lowered. When the aileron is deflected downwards, the streamlines above the wing become faster and closer together, which means greater lift is being developed and the wing rises. This is a symmetrical airfoil at a zero degree angle of attack. The streamlines above and below the wing are the same, which means that such a wing creates no net lift unless flown at a positive angle of attack or a negative angle of attack. At too large an angle, the wing stalls. This shows the airflow about a cylinder and all of the turbulence and drag created behind it. It explains why designers avoid using circular shapes for struts and so forth. But look what happens when we rotate the cylinder clockwise. More lift is developed beneath the cylinder than above it. Now, if this were a baseball, it would curve in the direction of greatest lift, which in this case is downward. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You know, that tunnel brought back some wonderful memories. When I was in high school, I built a wind tunnel for the science fair. Oh, it wasn't much of a tunnel, but I had a lot of fun building and playing with it. You know, in a way, my very first wind tunnel was my dad's old car back in the 50s. At first, I would just stick my hand out the window like this to see how changing the shape of my hand would alter the lift it would create. And many of you have probably done the same. But then I built some models to stick out the window. I'll show you what I mean. First, however, we have to measure our airspeed, and I just happen to have this anemometer handy. Okay, let's see. Our airspeed is, well, exactly 40 miles an hour. 
And according to our speedometer, our ground speed is 45 miles an hour. That means we're driving with a five mile an hour tailwind. Now, let's see how this model performs. By adjusting the pitch angle, you can find the angle of minimum drag. Oh, it's right about here. And by raising the nose, you can feel the increase in lift as well as the increase in drag. It's a great way to experience the basic principles of flight. At large angles of attack, you can sometimes even feel the burble of a stalling wing. But be careful not to increase the angle of attack too much, or you're likely to lose an expensive model. You know, one thing I always wanted to do was to build a model big enough to sit in. I wanted to mount it and pivot it on the roof of my dad's car to see what it would be like to roll and pitch in the wind. I like a real airplane. Now, this was before I had enough money to take a real flying lesson. But my dad, well, he wouldn't have anything to do with it. He said that I'd either ruin his car or kill myself or both. Yeah, he was probably right. Every pilot knows about those hazardous wingtip vortices spawned by large jetliners. Now, the wing of a small airplane also generates these vortices, but you don't hear much about them. As a matter of fact, you've probably never even seen a wingtip vortex on a light airplane. Would you like to? <laughs> don't answer that. You don't even have a choice. All we need to do is attach some yarn to this wingtip using some tape like so. I'm going to take the next one. And then go flying. As we begin the takeoff roll, the strands of yarn are blown aft by the relative wind. But now watch what happens when I wrote the, rotate the nose and the wing begins to develop substantial lift. There, you see it? A wingtip vortex. Isn't that fabulous? Everyone knows that the wingtip vortex diminishes as speed increases or at reduced angles of attack. Let's watch and see what happens to the vortex as it increases as I raise the nose and reduce airspeed. It intensifies quite a bit. It's really beginning to whip around, as you can see. And now, just as we're ready to stall, I'm going to lower the nose and notice that the wingtip vortex almost comes to a halt. Here's a fascinating view of a wingtip spawning a vortex in Northrop Rice's smoke tunnel. Now look at how the vortex increases in intensity as the angle of attack is increased and how it weakens as the angle of attack is reduced. There are lots of things in flying that we're aware of but can't see. G loads are an example. Now we understand G's and load factors, but for some it's a difficult concept to visualize. That's why I've put together this demonstration. As you can see, this bag of lead weights on the bathroom scale in the right rear seat weighs 50 pounds. But if we were to increase the G load on the airplane, the load on the scale would also increase. For example, I'm going to roll into a progressively steeper and steeper bank. Finally, the bank will be so steep that the G load doubles. And now, now watch the load diminish as I roll out of the turn. This scale is really just a crude G meter. Now, we're going to fly the airplane without any G load at all. Now, all we have to do is pitched down with sufficient vigor. But first, I'll place this rubber ducky on the glare shield so that we'll know when we've reached a zero G condition. Okay, wheel forward, uh, voila, there we are. Zero Gs, just like the astronauts. Now, I'll do it again, but this time I want you to notice the indication on the scale. Okay, here we go. Uh, the scale confirms that we're weightless, all right. Here's something else you'll find interesting. 
and might want to use to entertain your friends at dinner. Now the first thing I'm going to do is insert this spoon into this fork like so. And then I'm going to take this toothpick and insert it very carefully between the tines of the fork like so in an attempt to balance the whole thing like so. Now most people can't understand how this is possible. After all, all of the weight of the spoon and the fork is being supported at this end of the toothpick with absolutely nothing to balance it on the other end. The silverware should simply topple off to the side. Ah, but that's obviously not the way it works. Now this point here, where the toothpick rests on the glass, is the fulcrum, the center of gravity of what is being supported. Balance occurs because the sum of the moments on this side of the fulcrum is equal to the moments on this side. Some people find it just as difficult to understand the weight and balance of an airplane. Well, speaking of weight and balance, how would you like to learn how to find the center of gravity of an airplane while in flight without having to do any math at all? Now, I think you're going to like this. Pilots are taught that an airplane rolls, pitches, and yaws about its center of gravity. So, if we can find the pivot point of an airplane, we will have found its center of gravity. Now, I'll show you what I mean. For example, if I kick some left rudder and make the airplane yaw to the left, the slip skid ball will slew to the right. Now, that's because the nose yaws left, which causes the ball to go right. But it only works this way when the instrument is located forward of the center of gravity which is where it always is. But what would happen if the instrument were placed in the back of the airplane, behind the airplane's pivot point? Well, let's do that, and we'll see. As I kick left rudder, you'll notice that the ball goes in what appears to be in the wrong direction. Instead of going to the right, it goes left. Now, that's because left rudder causes the tail to go to the right. And since the slip skid ball is behind the center of gravity, this causes the ball to go opposite to the movement of the tail, or in this case, to the left. Now, what do you think will happen if we slowly move the instrument forward toward the airplane's center of gravity? Well, as the instrument approaches the CG, the slip skid ball will react less and less. Now, finally, when the instrument is located at the center of gravity, the slip skid ball will no longer react to aircraft yaw. In other words, we will have located the center of gravity of the airplane without any mathematics whatsoever. Now, by the way, this is why passengers seated closest to the center of gravity in an airliner or on a small airplane get the most comfortable ride in turbulence. They don't feel the yawing and the pitching and the rolling as much when near the airplane's pivot point. Before leaving, I'd like to show you how I did that trick at the beginning of the segment about changing inky water into clear water. What you didn't see was that I had earlier poured a bit of bleach, like so, into what appeared to be an empty glass. Then, when I poured this inky water into that glass, the bleach simply did its thing and removed the stain. Easy. I suppose this just helps to demonstrate that the most interesting elements often are those we cannot see. Now, tell me, Hans, have you been drinking my formaldehyde? <laughs>